Good morning, church. Good to have you with us either here on site, maybe in our fellowship hall, or watching online. I'd like to start out with a surprisingly theological question. What is the grossest thing you've ever eaten? Many years as a youth pastor, I had opportunities to eat some pretty gross things. In fact, one of my delights uh, was to be creative in food-eating games and uh, got to watch some other people eat some particularly gross items. But in all my years of watching some of these kind of games, by far one of the most impressive food-eating challenges I ever experienced was watching a high school young lady named Sarah. Oftentimes our youth group will go down to Camp Shamanal, we go to Fall Fling, it's a, a fall retreat that we take, really enjoy it, it's a three-day weekend, and usually we would start by going to the Dairy Queen in Motley, and that's kind of where we would do our dinner on Friday night. This particular year we stopped at Dairy Queen and we're standing in line getting ready to order our food, and as I was sitting there I noticed this advertisement for the brand new Pumpkin Pie Blizzard. And I love pumpkin pie, and I love ice cream, but something about chunks of pie crust in my blizzard just sounded really gross to me. Like, it just, it didn't seem to work to me. And so I was remarking on this to the students in line, like, oh, that's gross, I'd never eat that. And so, of course, when I got back to my table and sat down to eat my meal, some of the students brought me a pumpkin pie blizzard for me to eat. They dared me to eat it, and I didn't. <laughs> I refused. I'm not going to eat that thing. And so we went to Shamana, had some spiritual growth. We had some fun. Great weekend. And here it is, Sunday, late morning, early afternoon. We are packing up the van for the return trip home. And there was that pumpkin pie blizzard still sitting in the front window of the church van. It had been there all weekend. And so we were packing up, and one of the people who was helping me pack things up was Sarah. And I just kind of jokingly looked over to her, and I said, Hey, Sarah, I dare you to drink that pumpkin pie blizzard. <sighs> and much to my horror, she didn't even hesitate. She grabbed the blizzard, ripped the lid off, and chugged it down. Like 30 seconds, the whole thing. My first response was, wow, that was impressive. <laughs> I was truly impressed. I was like, wow. And then I started to get a little embarrassed. Like, you mean I couldn't drink this thing on Friday and then this high school girl here shows me up in front of the whole youth group and chugs the whole thing down? And thought, why was I so reluctant? You know? And then I had my third and pretty much final response uh, to this food-eating challenge. I started to think about the fact that we were headed home for Bemidji and that Sarah's parents were probably going to find out that the youth pastor dared their sweet, precious daughter <laughs> to, to drink this two-day-old blizzard. And to make matters even more complicated and, and uncomfortable, Sarah's dad was one of the pastors at the church. It was Pastor Mick Marino's daughter, Sarah. And so I went back and I told Pastor Mick, and he was totally chill about it. And that is a pun for those of you who are paying attention. But it's also a true story. And the reason it has theological significance is in our story this morning, Acts 10, when we read about this, what we're going to find is that God presents the Apostle Peter with a food-eating challenge. And Peter doesn't refuse to eat it because he thinks it's gross, but the reason Peter is so hesitant, he's so reluctant, is that he thinks this food is impure, that it's unclean. And it's not that God is daring him to eat it. God is actually commanding him. He tells him, eat it, get up, kill, and eat. And in the midst of this, what we find is that God is presenting this food challenge to Peter in order to teach him and us 
something way more important than simply physical food. God is about to call Peter to lead the church in this extremely controversial direction. And we're going to learn about that today. And before we jump into the text, would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of Cornelius. Cornelius. Thank you for this event that happened in real time in history and that was recorded by Luke in the book of Acts so that we can not only enjoy the story but learn from it. So please help us, Lord God, to rightly understand this text and then rightly apply it to our own lives that we might live it out for your glory. So please help us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please turn or tap in your Bible to Acts chapter 10, verse 1. This morning in particular, you're going to want to have your own Bible open because we're actually building the whole Scripture reading right into the sermon. So we'll look at a section of verses, talk about them, and then go to the next section of verses. So it really would help to have your own copy of God's Word uh, right with you as we go through. And we'll break this down into basically four sections. The first one is Acts 10, verses 1 through 8. Cornelius' vision. Verse 1 begins, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. So being a centurion, what that means is that he was a military man. He commanded about a hundred other troops for Rome and helped take care of keeping the peace and so on. But this particular centurion was God-fearing, and by no means were all centurions this way, but he happened to be, and and it's noted in the text that we recognize that. And for those of us who are modern-day Gentiles, this idea of being a God-fearer might not quite make as much sense to us. What does that mean to be a God-fearer, God-fearing And what it's getting at here is that Cornelius was not a full-fledged convert to Judaism. He did believe in one God. He did respect the moral and ethical teachings of the, the Jewish people, but he himself had not been circumcised, and he was not following the Jewish dietary laws and some of those things that a full convert would do. Um, But he did have a, a fear of God, a respect for the one God. His story goes on in verse 3. One day at about 3 in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. Well, what is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. And so this is right where we left off last week in Acts 9.31. It told us that the Apostle Peter, after going to Joppa and and doing some things there, he stayed there for some time. Verse 7 says, When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Let's take a look at our map together. We'll see here that Caesarea is up north. It's actually about 30 miles north of Joppa. Joppa is the city that Peter had gone to. He did a couple of miracles there, one of them being raising Tabitha up from the dead uh, was the miracle there. The other one was in Lydda. And in Acts 10 now, what we're going to see is that men from up north in Caesarea are going to come down south to Joppa, get the apostle Peter, and bring him back up north. Next section of verses starts at verse 9 through 23. This is Peter's vision. So meanwhile, down south in Joppa, verse 9 continues, about noon the following day as they were on their journey and approaching the city of Joppa, Peter went up on the roof to pray. And it was common to go up on your roof back then. Usually they would have a flat roof and uh, there'd be a little stairwell outside the house. It was really easy to get up there, and you might go there to relax or for some privacy. Uh, We might think of it as kind of like having a back deck on the backyard of your house, just a nice place to hang out and be for various things. And in verse 10, Peter became hungry and wanted something to eat. 
And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened, something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And this phrase here, anything impure or unclean, that's a reference to the Jewish dietary laws. Frankly, laws the Jews had followed for over a thousand years there was a huge tradition and practice of ceremonially being ceremonially clean by being careful what you ate. And if we were to look at Leviticus 11.44, it makes it really clear that the purpose of these religious dietary restrictions was to teach people that God is holy and that because your God is holy, you also ought to be holy, ought to live holy lives. The Jewish food laws were also meant to underscore Israel's separation from other surrounding nations, that they were to be distinct, they were to be different, they were God's special chosen people who were to live holy and consecrated lives before the Lord, and all they did throughout the day and throughout the night, all of it was to honor Him, and it was to be this example to all of the other watching nations demonstrate to them that God is holy, that He's worthy of praise, He's worthy of our full devotion. If you want to better understand which animals were okay and which weren't, you'd actually need to read through all of Leviticus 11. I'd encourage you to consider doing that this week, Leviticus 11. It's pretty interesting stuff to read, and when you get to the end of it, I would also encourage you to pray and thank the Lord that we're under the new covenant. And uh, we don't have to jump through quite those same types of hoops. But just to be clear on that, God's holiness has not changed. And God's desire that his people be a holy people, that has not changed. But what has changed between the old covenant and the new covenant are the rules about which foods God's people should and shouldn't eat. In verse 13, when God tells Peter to kill and eat, it actually has kind of a, a sacrificial bent to it. The connotation here is that you would sacrifice this animal when, when you kill it. It's a sacrificial act. In other words, it wasn't just about Peter's physical hunger, getting something to eat, but its significance was more. What are you killing, and then what would you put in your mouth, and what would the spiritual connotations be? And in verse 14, I think Peter, rather than taking a second to maybe think about what he was about to say, he just kind of blurts it out. He's responding to this voice from heaven, and Peter's knee-jerk response is just to refuse. No, I won't do it, Lord. I won't do what you're commanding me to do. And I'm not sure he really thought about who he was talking to. It is possible, though, that Peter did realize that he was speaking to the Lord and his instant response of saying, I'm not going to do that, was feeling like maybe the Lord was testing him and he wanted to prove his devotion, that he was a, a holy Jew living in reverence for God. And so he was saying, God, I'm not going to do that. I, I passed the test. I'm living a holy life. Well, verse 15 continues, the voice spoke to him a second time, don't call anything impure that God has made clean. And this happened three times. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. And immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? 
The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. And so Peter now understands what God is doing and why these men are here at his uh, doorway. They're here because they want to know what he has to share with them, what he has to say. Verse 23, then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. And apparently at this point, Peter has already started to see enough and he had heard enough that he makes this really kind of surprising decision to invite these unclean Gentiles into his home. Really, it's Simon the Tanner's home, but it's where Peter is also staying. But by providing lodging for these Gentiles, Peter was already kind of taking his first little baby step in the direction of this really controversial thing. Because this would indicate some intimacy when you invite someone into your home, when you would invite a Gentile into your home, this would be very contrary to the prescribed Jewish practice. Religious Jews, devoted Jews, they just wouldn't do that. But Peter did, and he takes this tiny little step toward this extremely controversial direction that, frankly, God is going to have Peter take the whole church in. And verse 23 concludes, the next day Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along. Well, I want to pay attention to that. He brought some other believers along with him. It, it wasn't just because he wanted a little company or was hoping maybe they would carry his luggage for him. <laughs> That's not what's going on here. Uh, later on, Acts 10, 45 clarifies that these believers had all been circumcised. And these were fellow Jewish believers he was bringing with him. In other words, Peter was intentionally bringing some other witnesses along. He wanted some other people there to see what God was doing so they could attest to it, so they could give testimony that God is doing this extremely controversial thing and he wants some other people there to watch it. Our next section of verses starts verses 24 through 33 where Peter visits Cornelius. So they head up north and it says the following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. <coughs> Excuse me. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. In other words, after having invited Gentiles into his own home, now he was going into a Gentile home, which was also not supposed to be happening. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? And Peter doesn't mince his words here. He basically calls the elephant in the room, the elephant in the room. Hey, guys, this is really awkward. I am really uncomfortable in your house right now. I don't know how you're feeling, but I'm feeling way out of my element. Not real tactful, but honest. However, he's also really quick to add that this is all God's doing. As Peter now clearly understands and articulates the meaning of God's object lesson. Back in verse 12, the sheet that was lowered down from heaven containing all kinds of animals was meant to illustrate the truth that Peter now declares here in verse 28. God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So we move from anything to anyone from the object lesson to the point of the object lesson. In other words, this vision had a much deeper significance than just teaching Peter that he no longer needed to make these distinctions between clean and unclean animals. It wasn't about food really at all at this point. But Peter now realized that the barrier between Jews and Gentiles had been taken down. 
it had been removed. This extremely controversial direction turns out to be this incredible, marvelous, wonderful spiritual reality. The separation between these supposedly spiritually clean Jews and unclean Gentiles had been taken down by the cross of Jesus Christ. This cross takes down racial barriers, part of what it was intended to do. Unless we miss the direct application here for us, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are among the very Gentiles who are blessed by this reality. And we can praise God for that. Praise the Lord. Verse 29, Peter basically repeats the same question that he had asked back in verse 22. May I ask why you sent for me? And in verse 30, it tells us, Cornelius answered, Three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God, to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. This leads us right into the final section of verses. Acts 10, 34 through 48. The Holy Spirit is poured out. Peter launches right in in verse 34. It says, Then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. So Peter now realizes what at first was very confusing to him, very concerning to him, very awkward, even almost offensive to him, but now he realizes God does not favor one person over another person based on things like their ethnicity or their nationality or whatever other racial skin color, whatever kind of demarcation we might want to use to try to make distinction between ourselves. Our God is a God who keeps watch for anyone who fears him, anyone who desires to live rightly in this world. He's looking at the heart, not at the outer shell. In other words, God hears our prayers and he sees our good works even before the day of our salvation. God is watching. God is looking all throughout the world. Back in Acts 10, 2, early on in our story, when it mentions that Cornelius prayed to God regularly, the thing we should recognize is Cornelius wasn't even praying in Jesus' name. He wasn't even doing it the right way. And yet, God heard his prayer. God noticed Cornelius. Throughout all the world, God saw him right there. And yet, even though Cornelius was a person who already feared God and who was already doing many right things in his life, there was still something he lacked something that he and the others with him needed to hear from Peter. What's really weird about this, though, is God goes and sends Peter to share something that they already knew. Take a look at verse 36. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know... What happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee and after the baptism that John preached? It's a reference to John the Baptist. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. But you know all these things. Peter's telling them what they already know. See, the Gentiles had already heard about Jesus. They were well aware. His earthly ministry made a significant impact in the world that wasn't just a small group of Jews who heard about this. 
The whole region had heard of Jesus and knew about Jesus. In essence, what Peter is saying is, you know it. Now you need to respond to it. He goes on in Acts 10, 39, We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. You know it. Now you need to respond to it. Anyone who believes receives. Everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And apparently, at this point, Peter had said all that he really needed to say to those who were gathered there, those Gentiles, because they put their faith in Jesus before Peter can even finish his message. Verse 44 says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished, astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues, and praising God. The evidence for how genuine with this was was undeniable. They were right there themselves watching this happen, hearing this happen with their own ears. Verse 46 records, these Gentiles were speaking in tongues. Some people actually refer to Acts 10 as the Gentile Pentecost because it makes us think back to Acts 2, the initial, the original Pentecost that we learned about when we were just starting out the book of Acts. And the fact is that one of the most practical reasons for why God had the gift of tongues in the early church was this reason right here, that it helped the Jewish Christians see that the changes in these Gentile Christians were real, that they were of God. In other words, the speaking in tongues from back in Acts 2 helped prepare the Jewish Christians to accept this extremely controversial reality that the faith of Cornelius and these Gentiles was indeed legitimate. There's something else to be noticed here, though. The coming of the Holy Spirit on these Gentiles not only confirmed their salvation, it did something else. It proved that God had initiated this movement, that God had initiated this mission to the Gentiles and that he fully approved of it. You see, way back in Acts 1-8, which has been about 10 years ago now, back in Acts 1-8, Jesus had made a seemingly clear prediction that they would be as witnesses to the ends of the earth. But apparently, the early Jewish Christians had still failed to understand that the gospel was for Gentiles as well as for Jews, and that they would all alike share in the benefits of redemption. Here's what I mean. The Jews had a consistent history of allowing other people to join them, allowing Gentiles to become circumcised and convert to Judaism. They'd been doing that for hundreds of years, for pretty much their whole history. There was a way that you could join Judaism if you were willing to be circumcised and follow all the Jewish rules and laws. In fact, it's interesting, if we look back at Pentecost in Acts 2.11, let me show you something there. Acts 2.11 records that they heard both Jews and converts to Judaism declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. In other words, Cornelius and the other Gentiles with him that day were not technically the first Gentiles to speak in tongues. But they did make quite an impression on the Jews who were there and watching this. You see, they'd become very comfortable with any Gentiles who essentially were willing to become Jews and then gain favor from God. But that's not what's happening here in Acts 10. 
This is something markedly different. The Gentiles weren't joining Judaism and then converting to Christianity. They were leaping straight to faith. There was no two-step process. The Gentiles jumped directly to the Christian faith without even being circumcised first. To put it another way, they weren't astonished just because the gift of speaking in tongues was being poured out on the Gentiles, but that it was being poured out on uncircumcised Gentiles. And this was mind-blowing to them, hard for them to understand. It didn't compute well, and yet it was happening right in front of them, right in front of these circumcised Jewish believers. And again, that's why Peter brought some other people along. And we're going to talk about this extreme controversy a little bit more when we get to Acts 11, but Acts 11:18 says, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. There's a pastor named Kevin DeYoung, and he says it this way, The Gentiles have gladly received the gospel, and God has gladly received the Gentiles. Again, brothers and sisters in Christ, that's you and me. Unless you're Jewish, this is talking about us. Praise the Lord that we've been invited in, that we can just become Christians through faith, repenting, turning to Jesus. Well, to his credit, now that Peter understands this new thing that God is doing, he is all in, he is committed. In Acts 10, 47 and 48, Peter concludes the whole passage. Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So he's going to stay up in Caesarea for a little while. What's interesting here is after God sent the gift of tongues as this external sign which publicly confirmed his approval of the Gentiles, Peter then confirms his own approval of this Gentile salvation by ordering the external sign of publicly baptizing these new Gentile believers, publicly showing these are our new brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's celebrate it with a public baptism. And I want everyone to know we were here (laughs) and welcoming them in to the family of God. After all, in Peter's words, they have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Baptism is a, a public and outward testimony to other people about an inward change that has happened in our lives. And that's why as a church here at Ephraim Bemidji, we encourage people to be baptized in water. Whether you've recently come to Christ or whether you've been following Jesus a long time, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, it's important that you be baptized in water, that you make that public testimony. And so we encourage you to do that, and I would strongly encourage you to at least check out the baptism class. There's an insert in the bulletin. How fun it would be to celebrate that together here at our church and have that public time of celebration and worship together. So think about that. Cornelius. This is his story. Cornelius knew that he needed Jesus. Or at least he needed something more than he currently had. He didn't assume that he was already good enough on his own. He didn't assume that he needed to invite Peter up to share this message just for the sake of his friends and family. He knew his own need. In fact, we're later told again, later on when we get to Acts 11, 14, God said, Peter will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. So it wasn't Cornelius' good works or his prayers to God that saved him. It wasn't this incredible vision that he saw from this angel that saved him. It wasn't that the apostle Peter came into his home. That's not what saved him. In fact, if you think about it, it wasn't even hearing the message 
about Jesus that saved him. The thing that saved Cornelius is what saves any one of us, any one of us in this room or in the fellowship hall or the nursery, anyone watching from home via live stream. What saves us is responding to the message in repentance and faith. Responding to the message in repentance and faith. A few weeks back, you may remember if you were here that we rejoiced in the wonderful grace of God. As we saw Saul, who was treacherous, who maliciously was hating on the church, throwing people in jail, persecuting it terribly, and yet we learned that even the least likely to get saved are not beyond the reach of God's grace. And now here in Acts 10, we see the extreme opposite end of the spectrum, that no matter how good someone seems to be, how they feel like maybe they're, they're the least likely person to really need salvation, they're already so good. And yet even those people are not beyond the need for the reach of God's grace. Again, Pastor Kevin DeYoung, he rightly points out that the default setting in America is that all people need to do is be sincere. Just try to be as good of a person as you can be, and you'll go to heaven. We hear this basic message all over on TV and movies. In fact, just about every Hallmark movie ever made, that's pretty much the message. Just be a good person. Try really hard to be as good as you can, and you'll get into heaven. But that's not the message of the Bible. The Bible does not teach that. Jesus did not teach that. Acts 10 brings us this vital reminder as we look at the life of Cornelius, this really good, godly guy, God-fearing, helping the poor, praying regularly. But it's a reminder that even people who do all those things, even they need to repent. Even they need to trust in Jesus, to turn to Jesus in faith. Perhaps you know someone like Cornelius. In fact, during this message, as we move through the text, maybe that person has come to mind and you're thinking about someone you know. You think, yeah, they're such a good person. I mean, he's a great guy. She, she's a great woman. She's so good, always helping the poor and doing good things. But you know that that person still hasn't put faith in Jesus. And I would encourage you this week in particular to pray for that person you know. Pray for them by name. Pray that God will open their eyes and help them to see that even they need Jesus. And I would also encourage you to pray for yourself. That you'll be ready in case God calls you to be Peter in their life. God calls you to be ready to share the message with them. Pray for your own heart and your own readiness as God prepares them to know their need. It could be some of us here or watching via live stream recognize that you yourself are a lot like Cornelius. You've lived your whole life trying to be a really good person. You're always trying to help your neighbor, trying to do good things, give to nonprofits and charities, volunteer your time. You, you love helping other people. You, you want to be a good person. You, you see that the world is wrapped up in a lot of darkness and a lot of evil, and you don't want to be part of that. You, you want to be a good person. And yet you still feel like there's something missing from your life. Like there's some emptiness, something deep inside where you, you still feel like you need something more. You just haven't quite done enough or, or quite got there. And that thing that is missing is not a thing but a person. A person is Jesus Christ. That's who you're missing. In all your efforts to be good enough and do good enough things, you still need Jesus Christ. And maybe that's why you're here right now. Maybe that's why you're hearing this message. 
why you're listening on live stream right now is that this is an appointed time for you as we're in God's presence that you're here to listen to what God is trying to say to you. The message is for you as much as it was for Cornelius. In fact, perhaps just like Cornelius, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before the Lord today. And today, instead of calling Cornelius' name, perhaps God is calling your name. You're the one he's trying to get through to. God is more than ready to forgive your sin. He's more than ready to give you a new spiritual life, more than ready to fill you with his Holy Spirit. If you want to talk about that more, there are lots of people in this building today watching on live stream today. We'd love to tell you more about Jesus. We're, we're ready to go. We're prayed up. We'd, we'd love to tell you more. Please give us that opportunity. Let's pray together. Well, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the life of Cornelius, for his story that happened in real time and happened in real history and was recorded for us, that we might read it and learn from it. And we just thank you, Lord God, for the reminder of your love and your grace, your forgiveness for all peoples. Thank you that you accept people from every nation. And help us, Lord, to be truly thankful for that and to give you the praise that all of us are included in this opportunity to rejoice in the good news. Lord, for those of us who are like Cornelius, who spent our lives trying to do good, trying to be good, but haven't believed in you yet, I pray that today might be the day where that person says yes to you, where that person sees their need for Jesus and, and finds him and is, finds forgiveness for the first time ever. Lord, for those of us who know someone like Cornelius, we pray for that person's salvation even now. We pray for them by name. We pray for that friend or relative, someone from work or school, a neighbor. Lord, we pray that you would draw near to them by your spirit, that you would convince them that they need Jesus, that you would lead them to your salvation. And help us, Lord, to be ready to share. If they were to ask us, help us be ready. We pray all these things together now in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen.